I've seen more bears this year than I've seen in a long time. I saw a mother, mom and cubs back there last time and a, a big male bear too. They're all waiting for the fish to run up the river. I was born here in Sitka. Sheepka is the Clinket name, and the name now is Bernoff. That name should change back. Our place names have importance, and they had use. And the renaming of them is all actively in line with that erasure of indigenous histories, indigenous presence, indigenous land and language. We come from oral history. Our histories were shared orally and then passed on, and, and they continually are still. All of my work deals with language, whether it's Klingit language or the cultural language of our visual art. It's a very iconic, powerful, visual, abstract language that's distinct to our community that's continually evolved and it continues to still today. Oftentimes, identity for indigenous communities is frozen in the past. There's this idea of a time period of pre-contact, and that is responsible for heavily romanticizing this narrative of the vanishing Indian, or upholding us as peoples that are gone and not here. That's damaging. An Indian petroglyph. I think this is like 10 years old, maybe? He's out here for days, just chipping at it. There's these ideas of authenticity, culturally speaking. We are only authentic if we're visually fitting a bill, or our work is, or our material, or our process, or our tools. <laughs> Colonization has worked extremely diligently and hard to keep us in containers and boxes, not just through containment on reservations and land, but through our objects and institutions, our histories, our language. Suhedi Shugak Titan in Klinkit translates to, we will again open this container of wisdom that's been left in our care. That container of wisdom is our language, our dance, our music, our visual art, everything. And in a sovereign reclamation of power and space, that work is saying our work will look like this if it needs to. Our conversations will go here if they need to. We get to do whatever we want. We are allowed to imagine what form it can be without adhering to these ideas of romanticized perspective. I started in engraving and wood carving with my mentors, Wayne Price, Louis Menard, my father, and my uncle Will Burkhart. Nothing was more fulfilling for me than doing that work. And I was just eager to learn and try to understand what it means to be part of that continuum. I'm Nick's cousin. Our fathers are brothers. Both of them are Klingadars. My father has done a lot. Big monumental work, big totems, several canoes as well. He's an accomplished engraver. Definitely one of the masters out there. I can remember being five years old and running around Totem Park where my father would carve. It's definitely in our family, in our blood. This is a house post, so it's work in progress. It's just roughing it out right now. I'll carve this half and Leo follow on the other half. And then we just move through like that. This is a historically relevant way of working and for the parents to learn. In my uncle's studio and my father's bench was always all the tools. The foundation of all the work comes down to understanding a tool, how to make a tool, how to maintain a tool. Chlita, nads, this is the trunk of a tree, the branch. This particular one is a pattern ad, so it flexes. See that slight little 
My uncle made this 30 years ago. There's several different sizes of ads. Is gutter ads, which is the big curve for really, really heavy work. No flex in this. Hook knives, curved, bent knife. It's a blade on both sides. You can do lots of detail work with it if needed. I did an Associate of Arts degree, and then from there went to London Guildhall University. Going to London, I brought a lot of excitement, but they said I could not use any of my cultural visual language in my work there. They said it was too literal. Oftentimes, we are asked to hang up our identity at the doors of these institutions. That's an extension of the damaging philosophy of kill the Indian, save the man. That is the idea and desire and process of forced assimilation, of removing every aspect of our being, every aspect of it, the food and subsistence and land, the language, the removal of children from indigenous families, placing them in boarding schools, all of that. It was essentially genocide and colonial violence against indigenous and brown and black bodies and nation building of the U.S. hasn't really stopped. Later, going to Massey University in New Zealand to do my master's in visual art, I was able to engage in these conversations and this work and bring my cultural perspectives and identities. And that was where a lot of my work really started to take place and happen. This is forming metal, essentially, so chasing and repose. So you work it from both sides, front and back, and clink it culture. A lot of old pieces, you'll see copper shaped and formed in this process. I start off with a sheet of copper, shape it, and then start doing the detail work. So it's really slow, slow work. Like months and months to finish a mask. Masks in our culture are significant and are used in different contexts, from ceremony to healing to storytelling. For Killing and Save the Man, I worked with Indonesian-made tourist knockoff masks, and I carved them down to chips and then reassembled them as masks in a pile. That visual reference of having to shape ourselves so much that we can't see or make sense of ourselves is that jumble of chips in a new form of a mask. You'll see here in town even with our tourism, our culture being consumed, our objects being consumed so heavily that it's just the ideas of them without us. To strip that so far that we're removed from it, and all you have is this mimic, this misappropriation that's a peak colonial consumption. Wow, Noma, your hair's so nice! Oh, my gang! Oh, it looks so nice! Oh, dogs. I'm just gonna let them clean oh. the baby's food up. Right. Yep. Nick and I met at a conference for Native performance art. Between us, we have six kids. <laughs> one is one that's ours, that's a little little one-year-old, and then we've got older kids, each of us. Are you helping? Are you watching to make sure we do it right? This is sockeye. sockeye. You can catch them on a fly ah! and, and rod, but these are dip net. Nick can catch a king salmon on the paddleboard, net it and club it by himself <laughs> and paddle back to the boat with like three huge, and these are like 20 pound fish. They're not little. So it's not a small thing to net that fish. This is yeah. taking the yeah. bones out and cutting it down to size before we brine them. And then we'll dry them and glaze them. And for this, we're gonna full smoke. Okay, everybody have gloves? All the kids are around a lot in everything that we do, and it's really important to us to include them in our work as much as we can. Got it. 
Nick and I are very involved in supporting each other and collaborating on work when we can. We work collaboratively, but we also support each other's work, and we have different strengths, each of us, too. If we look at the process of salmon, skinning deer, picking berries, teaching our children the process of connection to place and land, all of these ways of surviving and being and caring and loving that got us here today, generationally, through our ancestors, has and holds something that I would say is a, like a memory in our DNA. And that memory in that DNA surfaces in those processes and through joy, like a, a feeling of joy. You can't capture it in any other way, but just let it pass through you. Yep, good. The only way you can share that is through teaching your children. In these institutional spaces across the globe, the wealth of culture that they have has oftentimes been mined and removed from other communities. Almost all of these objects have been stolen. Almost all of them have certainly been created for context of cultural use and not of colonial imprisonment. They're objects of power that don't belong in these spaces. It's a blueprint, it's a plan, it's a map. The next step for this, once this is covered in this pigment, will be to paint the floor plan of the Anchorage Museum with notes on where our cultural objects are in those spaces. So it almost be a, an escape route or a plan of removal. The idea that these objects wouldn't be here without those spaces is a major myth. We've cared for our culture and our objects and our community's knowledge and for 15,000 plus years, right? Our communities are fighting for many things, including the return of our objects. In some cases, return of our ancestors' bones. The real change isn't going to happen with our communities only being the ones that are responding and leading ways in these conversations. The real change has to come from the communities that are perpetuating it or the communities that are upholding it by remaining complicit in the system, in those institutions. And the work that I've been doing has always been about bringing light to some of these conversations. record for two years. It's gonna be released with Sub Pop Records, which is such a legendary record label. Music you can explore, like visual art, endlessly. Being able to move freely is really a necessity for me. There can be a lot of discovery and uncertainty and power and sound. You have to remain open to what that might be. For me, the process, it's more about being receptive and then trusting those ideas when they come. I don't know what'll be next. I don't have an expectation of that, and that's liberating. Mm -hmm.